Well, like they said in the video, welcome to Grace. Welcome to what the Lord is doing, and he's continuing to work here this morning. Pastor Gary's gone, but I get the privilege of filling in for him, and I hope you guys are excited because the Holy Spirit is here even though, the, even though Pastor Gary is not. So you guys ready? Okay, let's do this. Let's stand up one more time. Can you guys stand up with me? Now let's pray, because if you pray and ask God to speak to you, he will. If you're thinking about other things, he might be speaking to you, but you're not going to hear it. So let's ask him to speak to us right now and to use what is said from his word to change our lives. Let's pray. Father, we're asking you in the name of Jesus to speak to us right now. The things that we talk about right now would be uh, transforming for us. And that we'd live differently because of, how we, um, of what we hear today. So would you guide us now and would you open our minds and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you guys can sit down. Pastor Will just asked you to ask the person next to you what you're looking forward to doing on 4th of July. I don't know if you did what he said or not, but I want to ask you another question. What are you guys looking forward to in heaven? Okay, let me ask you this first. How many of you guys have thought about heaven in the past seven days? Good! Think about it. It's a good place. How many of you guys, who just raised your hand, as you thought about heaven, were excited about what you were thinking. Are you excited to be there? Guys, there is a future coming for us that is excellent. I'm looking forward to it. Now let me ask you this. What are you most looking forward to in heaven? I thought you'd say that. Jesus. Okay, here's the, maybe the question I should ask you. Of course, I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus more than anything. But there's a lot of other stuff I'm looking forward to also. And a lot of that has to do with people that I'm going to get to see. So who's the person or the people who you're most excited about seeing when you get there? Apostle Paul, good. My wife just asked me a few days ago, not about the sermon. She said, how long are we going to have to wait in line to get some time with Apostle Paul? I said, I don't know, but we're going to have the time. Okay, I'm looking forward to seeing the Apostle Paul too. Thank you. At least one person answered. Guys, when I preach, you've got to answer me or I'm going to fall asleep, okay? This is participation. So I'm looking forward to seeing the Apostle Paul too and a bunch of other people from the Bible. I'm also looking forward to seeing my sweet mom who um, left us in January of this year and my sister Jenny, who so many of you know, who left us last May. But there's another group of people that I'm... That I'm very excited about seeing also, and the thought of it motivates me to preach today and to do everything else that I do every day. I am motivated by this other group of people, so I'm not going to tell you who that group of people is yet, but first, we're going to read some scripture, okay? Luke 16. So if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles to Luke 16. This is exciting stuff. I hope you guys are going to be excited before we're done. Luke 16. Verse 1, Jesus told his disciples. Who's he speaking to? His disciples. He's talking to his disciples. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Okay. I think he's speaking to you. So here's the story that he's telling you. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So the rich man called the manager in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give me an account of your management because... You cannot be manager anymore. The manager said to himself, oh no, what am I to do? My master's taken away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. But hey, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do so that when I lose my job here at this company, people will welcome me into their houses. He's got a plan. This was his plan. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. There's a bunch of them. Tells us about two here. But he's got a bunch. There's a master, master has a bunch of debtors. And he asked the first one, so how much do you owe the master? And the, man, the, the, the guy answered, 800 gallons of olive oil. The manager told him, okay, take your bill, sit down, and make it 400. Verse 7. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat. He replied, he told him, take your bill and make it 800. 
the master commended, that means praised, the dishonest manager because he'd acted shrewdly. Then Jesus says, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind, their own stuff, than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth. There's Jesus' command. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Cool, huh? You guys get the story. Uh, <laughs> yeah, some of you are shaking your head going, like, what is that all about? You guys want to know what it's about? Okay, get ready to get excited. Okay, first, let's, let's talk about what it's about. Let's talk about who are the characters in this story. Okay, you got the manager. Jennifer, you're right. Manager. Okay, what else you got? Okay, the master. The master who's got all the money. Okay, and then somebody else said something here. Debtors. Okay. Jennifer, you be, you be the rich man. Yes. No, you be the manager. <laughs> she was too excited about being the rich man. Jennifer, you're, you're the manager. Okay. You're the manager. And we need a rich man over here. Kimson, you're the, you're the rich man. Okay. So Kimson's got the money. If you ever need money, just ask Kimson. Okay. And a lot of people need money. So Jennifer is going to manage what he's got. Okay. But this is how it works. Okay, we got Bill over here. Bill is thinking about opening a tea shop in Guadalampur. And so he goes to Kimson and says, hey, I need $50,000. Can you loan me some? Kimson's like, okay, it sounds like a good investment to me. Okay. Then you got Dimitar back here, and he's going to open a sushi shop, even though he's not Japanese, in um, Los Angeles. Okay, so Kimson puts out some other money. Then we got Jeff. Jeff's like, man, I'm going to open a surf shop in Hawaii. Hawaii. Thank you. Okay. Good place to open a surf shop, by the way. Not Texas. Okay. So this is what happens. Jennifer gets her job as the manager because Kimson can't handle all these people that are um, supposed to pay him. So Jennifer's job is to pay the manager or the owner the money that all these other people pay her. But there's some problems because Jennifer doesn't seem to understand the purpose of her job. See, the purpose of the manager is to make money for the rich man. You guys notice this? Sometimes your bosses get upset at you because he, they actually expect you to produce something. And Jennifer's got the cool office. She's got the company car. She's got the new Galaxy phone that kind of opens up. You know, she got everything. It's all paid for by the company. She got the expense account, 401k. She can take people to Fuzzy's Tacos without having to pay for it herself. I mean, this is cool. And yet, she's not paying the manager or the rich man. So the rich man finally calls, calls, texts Jennifer and says, hey, you need to come in here. We need to talk a little bit. And so she comes in and he's like, Jennifer, I hired you to make money for me. And you're just driving around in that fancy car. You're not doing anything. Looking busy, but this job you have is for my purposes, not yours. So, sorry, two weeks. You got two weeks, no more job available for you. And Jennifer is like, what am I going to do? So she's struggling with this, but she's not dumb. She understands the principle of relationship equity. She's thinking, two weeks, who's going to help me? Is he not going to help me? Who would help me? But she understands relationship equity. You guys know what equity is, right? Equity is when you buy the house for $100,000, it's worth $200,000, you get $100,000 of equity. There's something like that in relationships. There's certain people that if you call them at 11, or text them at 11.30 tonight, don't call them, text them and say, hey, I need a ride at the airport at 2 a.m. because I just found out I got to take a trip to Washington State. There's certain people that will pretend they didn't get the message. There's other people who will be like, they don't even have to ask, ask why. They say, I'll be there at what time? Now, why is it that some of them are right there and some of them are like pretending they didn't get the message? The reason probably has something to do with how much you've invested in their lives. Now, we'd like to be people who say, 
oh, we love everybody and we're going to take care of everybody. But the truth is you can't take everybody and take care of everybody. And so the people that you end up taking care of are the people who have built relationship equity with you. You guys know what I mean? Okay? So and it's probably the people who, when they texted you and said, I need a ride, they, you gave them a ride. So Jennifer understands this principle. She's the manager. She understands she's losing her job. And she's thinking, nobody can help me because I haven't helped anybody. Sorry, Jennifer's helped a lot of people. But you know, this, for example. And so she thinks, well, I still got two weeks left. And so I got a plan. I'm going to take this my, my position that I have now, right now, the resources that are available to me, and I'm going to see if I can make some friends. So she calls, let's see, it's, it's Jeff over here. She, she texts Jeff and says, hey, Jeff, I really care about you. I know you've had a lot of trouble in life. And I, got a, I got an offer for you. You go to pay that $25,000 right now, and we'll just call it, call the other $25,000 a write-off. And Jeff's like, I saved $25,000 for pay today. Here's the check. He writes it to her. She signs. He's free. He's happy. She's happy. And she calls the next one. Who else did we have? I'm trying to remember what all the business we had. I, oh, Kimson. Can't, can't remember what Kimson's business was. What were you opening up? Oh, no, you're the rich man. Okay. She texts the next one and says, hey, I'm cutting your, because I care about you, I'm cutting your debt in half. And that person is like, wow, good job, Jennifer. I love it. Okay, so she goes down the line and she makes all these friends because she understands that if she does some nice things for those people, then she's going to get a payback, hopefully in two weeks when she's out on her own. How does, how does Kimson, the rich man, respond when he finds out what Jennifer did? You expect him to be like, no way! After all your laziness and not producing anything for me and now you're going to rip me off one more time? But he doesn't do that. Instead, what we're told is that the rich man praised, commended the manager for how she handled this thing. Okay. Now you guys get the story, right? Well, kind of. Okay, but what does it mean? Okay, in this story, who is the rich man? God, thank you. Somebody back there said, if you didn't know already, he's the richest. Everything belongs to him. He's got it all. It all belongs to him. Now, who's the manager? Us. Very good. The manager, the managers are you and me. We've been given a certain amount of stuff, and we're supposed to produce something for the sake of the rich man. And we think, well, we're not sure I want to do that. Well, that's why you were created. Okay. Who are the debtors? Other people. It's the world. The world out there who has a debt to the rich man, but they're not paying it. Okay? Five things. Actually, I wrote down seven things in your notes, but I'm not going to have time to go through all seven, so I'm giving you five things that I think that Jesus is telling us from this story, and I think you're going to be excited by this. Okay? So first of all, you and me are the managers of someone else's property. What you have, by the way, isn't yours. What you have been entrusted with by the rich men has been given to you, entrusted to you, to accomplish his purposes. If you understand this, your life is going to be great. If you understand that you're alive for him, what you have is for him. Let me say it again. If you understand that everything that you have has been given to you for his purposes, you are going to live a satisfying life. That might not be easy, but you're going to live the life that's worth living. You're going to accomplish the purpose that you were created for. If you don't understand this, you're going to have a very frustrated life because you're always going to be trying to hang on to the things that he's entrusted to you and think that they're yours. Grasping them. And it is going to be very frustrating. Okay, secondly. Second thing. You have used the owner, the rich man's property that he entrusted to you. You have used it selfishly. So have I, confession. We all have. We have taken the things that have been entrusted to us and we've used them for our own satisfaction. 
Okay, what's the, what is the word that the Bible uses for taking the things that belong to God, that which belongs to God, and using it for our own glory or satisfaction? Sin. Somebody says sin back here. Guys, it's sin. Sin is taking what belongs to him and using it for me and not doing, not giving him what he deserves. Okay. Okay, number three. There is an upcoming end to your term of management. There's a time coming when your job that he entrusted you with is over. It's over. Where you don't have all that stuff that you used to have. What is the word that the Bible uses for the end of your term of management? Death. Romans 6.23 says what? The wages, that is the penalty, the payment, for mismanaging the owner's stuff, using it on yourself, the payment, the penalty for that is death. These bodies will die. Okay, fourth. It would be wise for you and me and all of us to think about what we are going to do when our two-week notice is up. What we're going to do when we no longer have this position. Notice what the manager does. What Jennifer did. As soon as she found out, oh man, this, I, I got to prove it. I got to do something. She goes to work. But what does that mean for us? What Jesus is teaching us is that we need to start thinking right now about what the, it's going to be like when this body can't breathe anymore. When this body is no longer mine. Now, I want to just clarify what we're talking about in this story. Remember, he spoke this to his disciples. This is a story, this metaphor that he's given us is for those people who are his. Well, I want to clarify that because our way into heaven is not the result of how hard we work or how good you are. Your way into heaven is through what Jesus did, his perfection put on you. He took all of your sin, and he gave you all of his perfectness. You don't have to earn it anymore. So what this, this isn't ta talking about salvation. This is talking about something else, something more than that. Okay? It'd be wise for us to think about what that's going to be like when we no longer are here in this life. Okay? Are you ready for the day when this life, as we know it now, is over? You don't have the, the air that you breathe is no longer yours, the body you have is no longer yours, the house you have, the fame you have, the, all the support you have, the relationship, when it's just you. Are you ready for that day? And Jesus is telling us a little bit here about how to get ready for that day. Number five, Jesus is encouraging you and me, to use the resources that we've been given, that we've been entrusted with, to reconcile the rich man and the debtors. That's his, that's his point here. He's asking us. He's explaining to us. He's explaining to his disciples. He, learn, the, learn from the rich man. Look at verse 8 and 9. Look what he says here. He says, the master commended the dishonest manager. He didn't, he didn't commend him because he was dishonest. He commended him because he'd acted shrewdly. What is shrewdness? Shrewdness is the ability to, to use what I have in my, in my pr present position, present place where I am, to benefit myself in a greater way in the future. So the master it, it, uh, it commended this guy, praised this guy, because he was able to think far enough ahead and use what he had right now to benefit himself in the future. And Jesus is teaching us that we ought to do the same thing. Jesus wants us to be smart, shrewd. Because here's the message from this. You have the opportunity right now 
to use resources that do not belong to you, that have simply been entrusted to you to help people who are in debt to the rich man get free from their debt. Does that make sense? Let me say it again. You have the opportunity right now with the resources that have been entrusted to you that really aren't yours to help people who are in debt to the rich man get free from their debt. We have management positions. We have management responsibility. One of the most impacting verses, motivating verses in my life is from John 20, 23. The day that Jesus comes to life. He meets some of his disciples. He meets some of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. Then he comes back into that room where they're all hiding out. And it says, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit so that you can continue doing the things that I've been doing. And with that, he says, if you, my disciples, forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. And if you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. Think about what that means. The reason this is motivating for me is because the resources, you've got all kinds of resources that the Lord has given you to use for his glory to reconcile the, the people in debt with the rich man. But the one greatest commodity that, that he, commodity that he has offered you is this ability to proclaim the forgiveness of sins to people who don't know that it's there. They don't know it's there. The, the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins into people's lives will change people's lives. Did Jesus not die for all people? 1 John 2, 2, he died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. But that doesn't mean that every person is automatically saved because they don't, haven't applied the forgiveness that is available to them, to their lives, and they're waiting for you to tell them. Guys, our business, say people, say, people didn't know, and they said, what, what, what are you guys selling there? We're not selling anything. We're giving it away for free, and this is what we give away. We are in the business of forgiveness. Amen. Would you guys just say that with me? Say, we're in the business of forgiveness. Okay, say it a little bit louder. Say it personally. Say, I am in the business of forgiveness. This is what we offer to the world. This is what we're offering. I want you to think about people around the world who know Jesus right now because of people in this room. People in Nigeria, people in Cameroon, people in, in Israel, Egypt, Bulgaria, Vanuatu, Japan, Philippines, Malaysia, India. Guys, there are people all around the world and all over this city who know Jesus right now because of people in this room. And when those people meet you in eternity, what are they going to say to you? Hey, what's up, man? No way. They're going to say, you're a part of Grace Community Church. That's the church that sent the people to my village so that now I'm here. I know Jesus because of you guys. Because the people at Grace Community Church went there. Or they supported the people that... that went there. And I look forward today, guys, this is what this is the group of people that I am looking forward to most and seeing in eternity is the people who when I'm walking by guys remember what heaven is. Heaven is just some small place place out there. Heaven is huge and in the future earth gets enveloped into heaven. Jesus comes back and his his prayer that your kingdom come on earth. That's coming. It's enveloped in, it's included in heaven. And on that day, in those days, I look forward. This motivates me, guys. I'm looking forward to the, the days that I'm walking through areas of heaven. And people are like, dude, that's Steve. And they run out of there, hug me and say, thank you. It's because of you that I'm here. I look forward to that, guys. I'm motivated by that. I'm living for that experience. And some of you guys are thinking, no way, heaven's not like that. And I'm saying, yes, it is. We just read about it. We just read about this. In this story, Jesus gives us one command. What's the command? Quick, look, 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 look. We only got a few minutes. 
He says this. I'll tell you what it is, since you guys aren't with me. Okay. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. That's the command. Use what you got to gain friends for yourselves. And then he tells us why. Because that way, when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Guys, this is what Jesus is telling us to do. There's a day coming when Mark and Tina, when people from the Lele tribe open their doors and say, because you guys, I'm here. I'm here because of you. I'm thinking about the Ogd people that I grew up with because of what my dad did. That there's going to be people, so many Ogd people in heaven because my dad, my parents went there in 1962 and for 36 years had no results. But in the year 37, the people came to the Lord. Thanks to the work of the Lord and the work that my parents did. Guys, you have the opportunity right now, even today, to proclaim the message of forgiveness to people who are in debt to the rich men who don't even know how they're ever going to get under it, out from under it. You have the message of forgiveness available to them. Jesus' command to us, this is command, this, is, this isn't just like, well, maybe you might think about it. He's saying, use what you got today to win friends Amen. so that throughout eternity, you're the person who says, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because you proclaim that message to me, I'm here. Okay, this is what we're going to do as we close. First of all, some of you might be here and you're like, man, I'm, I'm not free from the debt of sin that I've been under, that I owe to the king. Well, today I just want to speak forgiveness over you. You are forgiven in the name of Jesus. Amen. You all are forgiven in the name of Jesus. Every sin that you've ever committed in this room has been nailed to the cross of Jesus and you are free. You are free. Because some of you guys are saying, I already know that. Okay, to, you, to those of you who already know that, who have, have already received the forgiveness of sins and benefited from that, what Jesus did on the cross, to you, I want to I plead. Let's live our lives with that day in mind. So that you will be welcomed into those people's homes. There's real homes there. There's real people. you got to get this never, never land idea of heaven out of your mind. This is a real experience that we will live in forever and ever, and I can't wait. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. Yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you as we close, if you're somebody who is, is saying, I need that forgiveness of sins. And today, for the first time, I'm believing that the forgiveness is available for me, and I trust in Jesus. I'm going to ask you, you to stand up. But I'm also going to ask others of you, maybe all of you, if you want, to stand up. If you're saying, I want to live the rest of my life with this kind of thing in mind, with what Jesus is saying in mind, where I realize my managerial responsibility, this joyful privilege to proclaim the freedom that is available through the forgiveness of Jesus to the world. And I'm, I want to stand up and I want to say, I'm going to do that. I want, to, I want to spend the rest of my life, all my time, all my money, all my energy, everything that I've got, giving to Jesus what he deserves from the people of the world. Okay, so if you're a part of either one of those two groups, I just want to invite you to stand up and then we're going to close. Lord Jesus, here we are as a community of people who need you and love you and ha are here to, to, to represent you to the world. So I'm asking the Lord for every person that's standing up who's saying, yes, Lord, I accept your forgiveness and I'm, gi I'm given every day of the rest of my life to your, to your kingdom work, your managerial, my, my managerial responsibility of proclaiming the, the forgiveness that is available in Jesus Christ to everybody that I know. Thank you, Lord, that you're doing work in us, and I thank you for which, the people that we're going to see in eternity because it's people in this room. Would you give us grace and wisdom and your voice to know how to do this responsibly that the world would know that Jesus is king. 
We offer ourselves to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.